Hello and welcome to part four of this seven part series on the adapted to flee famine hypothesis, a scientific and revolutionary explanation of anorexia nervosa. So far, you've learned about four current theories being used to understand anorexia, why they lack conclusiveness, and how the adapted to flee famine theory provides an alternative view of the illness. Now it's time to look at three core adaptations of anorexia as proposed by the adapted to flee famine hypothesis, which are restriction, hyperactivity, and denial of starvation. In this video, we're going to be focusing on restriction. Be sure to like, subscribe, and without further ado, let's get into it. Food restriction is one of the three core symptoms of anorexia. Whereas the theories mentioned in part two of this series hypothesize that food restriction is a deliberate act of control or rebellion, the paradoxical behavior has also been observed in animal studies. When rats are starved in a lab and are given access to a running wheel, they will eventually refuse their food completely and run themselves to death. Some breeds of pigs can develop wasting pig syndrome where they will start to pace incessantly and ignore their food when they lose additional weight. We will get deeper into the compulsive movement piece in the next video or episode if you are listening to the podcast, but I just want to note something here now that we clearly have evidence of food refusal in species other than humans. Would we ask the rats or pigs refusing food if they felt sad or lonely or blame their insufficient intake on childhood trauma? Not to mention, we wouldn't blame their food refusal on fear of fatness either because some magazine told them they needed to lose weight. Not being able to associate fear of fatness with food refusal is also illustrated in the earliest recorded accounts of anorexia. During the Middle Ages, a time when many religious women fasted, some developed quote-unquote holy anorexia. The Roman Catholic Church officially canonized over 85 very thin saints, blesseds, or venerables who were recognized in part for their seemingly miraculous ability to live with very little food. Diaries and other first-hand accounts showed that these women manifested typical anorexia symptoms of aversion to food, overactivity, and denial of starvation, even though they lived in a time period where the ideal female body was not an underweight one. Aside from controlled animal studies and historic accounts, appetite also appears to be suppressed in wild animals when hunger and feeding compete with seemingly more quote-unquote important activities. When they need to defend their territory, incubate, or migrate, several species will stop eating even if food is readily available. As a result, Body weight may drop considerably and the animals will continue to restrict food as stopping to quote unquote eat and run would interfere with migration. Another consistent trait across humans and other mammals who display symptoms of anorexia can be found in the neuroendocrine system. In my course, Extremely Hungry to Completely Satisfied, I explain in depth how hunger and satiety cues are regulated in the body, so I recommend you check that out to gain a deeper understanding of those signals and, of course, what I'm about to explain with regards to the signals in anorexia. Normally, when an individual begins to starve, neurochemical signals of hunger are elevated and signals for satiety and activity are lowered. However, anorexia researchers have found that most neuromodulators and hormones influencing hunger, satiety, and activity are present in unusual concentrations that are opposite to those found in quote-unquote normal starvation. These findings are all consistent with adaptations to turn off eating and turn on traveling, as well as most anorexics' descriptions of finding it very difficult to eat and feeling restless and driven to exercise. 
I remember during my own eating disorder, I found it very difficult to eat simply because I felt full very quickly. As I describe in my course, fullness is signaled to the brain by fat cells. And by the way, if you enjoy this video format, if you're watching on YouTube, combining the audio and visual slides, I am 100% certain you will absolutely love and benefit so much from my course because it has the exact same structure. Just click the link in the description description to learn more or head over to livelabelfree.com forward slash extreme dash hunger dash course. Now back to the content, researchers have found that leptin levels elevate more rapidly than weight gain in individuals recovering from anorexia, which helps to understand why it's so hard to eat more in the early stages of recovery even though your body so desperately needs the food. This is why it is so important to honor mental hunger, which yes, is a form of extreme hunger, because your body may physically be unable to communicate the extreme hunger with you, and that's why it will opt for a more energetically efficient way, which is thinking about food. Furthermore, leptin levels often remain elevated in recovered anorexics. These findings led researchers to conclude that anorexics low body weight appears to be physiologically defended and helps explain why most people who develop anorexia do have naturally lower set points. Other hormones besides leptin that contribute to early satiety are cholecystokinin, serotonin, and dopamine. Cholecystokinin and serotonin specifically are responsible for satiety of carbohydrates, while dopamine is responsible for satiety of fats. These satiety hormones are elevated in underweight anorexic patients and often remain elevated even in recovered individuals. What's more is that elevated levels of serotonin have been linked to traits of perfectionism and rigidity commonly observed in individuals with anorexia. Interestingly, the appetite-promoting hormone galanin stays low in recovered anorexics. Abnormally low levels of galanin, a neuropeptide that stimulates appetite for fat, could potentially aid in understanding the aversion to high-fat foods not only in people with active anorexia, but even after they have been weight restored. Researchers are still closing in on the genetic mutations that lead to some of the biochemical alterations of appetite and satiety in anorexia. Leptin, melanocortin receptors, and their antagonists are responsible for the precise regulation of fat stores, and an individual's unique levels will defend their set point weight. In some forms of obesity, mutations that lead to loss of function in these molecules have been found, resulting in lack of satiety and thus stimulating overeating. In a 2001 study, researchers found that a large percentage of anorexia patients carried the same genetic mutation on a melanocortin antagonist, meaning the same gene functions opposite to the way in which it functions in a person who is genetically predisposed to be obese. This genetic finding explicates why anorexia sufferers with the genetic mutation are prone to abnormally early satiety even when they are drastically underweight. Hormones involved in stress and reward systems may also contribute to the paradoxical feelings of virtuousness when food is restricted. Although it is atypical, stress-seeking behavior has been described in several mammalian species, including humans. One study suggested that a mechanism for the development of anorexia may be the reward that some individuals experience from stress, which would support the adaptation to flee famine. Reward is mediated by the firing of dopamine neurons in the brain and enhanced by the secretion of adrenal hormones. Corticosterone is a specific adrenal hormone involved in the regulation of energy, immune reactions, and stress responses. 
It can stimulate feelings of euphoria and hyperactivity, which is absolutely fascinating considering the fact that increased levels of this hormone have been found in underweight anorexics. In conclusion, the stress of overexercise and extreme dieting may activate reward mechanisms in the brain so that self starvation is initially rewarding and subsequently conditioned. In a time of famine in which migration would have been a top priority, such an inverted reaction to a stressful situation would have been life saving. In contrast to biochemical alterations that promote satiety, neuropeptide Y and ghrelin, potent appetite stimulating molecules, are elevated in underweight anorexics. This elevation may be responsible for the obsession with food, which often manifests as a sudden and fanatic interest in recipes and cooking. Because of the biochemical changes discussed earlier though, anorexic individuals will still refuse food despite their obsession for it. This too is consistent with the adapted to flee famine hypothesis. Why else would a powerful appetite stimulating signaler remain high in anorexia if the function of the other changes was to postpone food searches until migration was completed? Presumably, if there were no hunger signaling mechanisms whatsoever, so if there was not even an ounce of mental hunger, prehistoric people with anorexia would not have begun eating when they arrived in the lands of abundance. And you've made it to the end of part four, all about how restriction is an adaptive mechanism to facilitate fleeing a famine. Please hit that like button if you are watching on YouTube and be sure to subscribe wherever you are watching or listening to this series. As you can hopefully tell, this type of content takes a lot of time and effort to create, so subscribing is a free way in which you can support me. If you want to get even more value, you can enroll in my course or learn about one-on-one -on -one coaching with me through the links in the description below. And I'll see you in the next video all about hyperactivity. Bye-bye now. Cool.